The next thing I want to talk about then is actual data modeling. So I have another presentation that I uh, encoded into some ugly slides to talk more about the data modeling concepts. So in the last slide deck, we mentioned that uh, essentially any computer application that we're going to create is a combination of two things. It's data models, and it is uh, an algorithm that then processes on top of those map models. So we have a input, we have beginning things, we have a, some desired results, and then we create a sequence that gets us from the beginning to the end, but the sequence relies on those data models we defined. And again, we'll talk more about that in this uh, section. So a quick overview for this is what is data modeling, types of data modeling, We'll talk about quantitative data versus qualitative data. We'll talk about computers and data modeling because we can model data, right? Outside of computers, da uh, data modeling was a thing like with recipes, with cooking, you don't need a computer for that. It's just a way of formalizing a set of instructions and passing it and a way of implementing those instructions, right? So using these particular data types, we're gonna call that. Our data types in cooking are things like how to measure ingredients, how to measure time and how to measure uh, heat. So whenever I say a data type, think of it as a way of measuring something. It's a unit, a set of values, and they, they're well-defined. Okay, so what is data modeling? Data modeling is the scientific approach to express a given problem domain in terms of quantitative values. And again, all that states there, it's a really fancy way of stating that Going back to our continued example of cooking, that we have a way of measuring our ingredients, a way of defining a measure of our time, our way of measuring our heat. Uh, in physics, right, there's lots of uh, like being able to do uh, um, movement we can do by measuring velocity, right? So anything that we need to be able to build an application around, we have to be able to construct a data model. And those data models will be when we start actually learning some Java code, be represented as a data type. Uh, we can define it as the development of a model, uh, usually mathematical, of a real world problem scenario or environment. This model is used to provide insights into the solution of the given problem. It isn't enough just to know the mathematical details of a particular modeling technique can be set up and solved. It is equally important to be familiar with the limitations, the assumptions, and specific applicability of the model. And so, the correct use of modeling techniques usually results in solutions that are timely, accurate, flexible, economical, reliable, easy to understand, and easy to use. Excellent. So does everyone understand what this slide is communicating? Is there anything that, that seems, and I'll, I will provide these slides to you as well. And I'll also provide this recording to you as well. So you will have a chance to look back at all of this. Uh, probably sometime after this lecture, I'll do that. Okay, so what are the different types of models? So our data models can be broadly classified into two categories based on the type and nature of the decision-making problem under consideration. So you have what are called deterministic models and you have probable, uh, probabilistic models. When I've been talking about the a recipe for cooking a cake, we've been talking about de deterministic models. These are models that, when I say deterministic, it's something that has no inherent randomness, no inherent chance, no inherent change to it, right? It's well-defined and it's going to be the same every time. What's an example when I say probabilistic model, which another term for probabilistic is stochastic. So stochastic is another common word that you might encounter if you ever see it in the world of computer science. It's just ascribing that it is a model that has an inherent randomness to it, or it is not deterministic. Uh, so can anyone think of a, what a probabilistic model might be like, or like an action and event? Like a card game. Exactly. A card game or like rolling in a die. I can't, if I wanted to like formally define rolling a die, I have to use a probabilistic model for that, right? To, if it's to represent the actual act of rolling a die, I couldn't just implement that as, yeah, roll the, the whatever the average would normally be, like the number three. Like that wouldn't be a die roll, right? That because I could get different values from that. And it's going to be different every time I roll it. 
So that is an example of when we try to model something that is based off of probability. And then I have to consider that when I define my model. So keep that in mind as you start creating your models that you then build your algorithms on top of. There are some models that are by definition have randomness in them. So again, we'll get more into this when we start talking about developing our algorithms. But that's an important uh, distinction. So again, deterministic models assume that all the relevant input data values are known with certainty. And that is that they assume that all the information needed for modeling the problem is available with fixed and known values. So in our recipe, everything's known, everything's fixed, and it's the same every time. In a probabilistic model, which can also be called a stochastic model, we assume that some input data values are not known with certainty. That is, they assume that these values of some important variables will not be known before decisions are made. And so it's therefore important to incorporate this kind of ignorance into our model. So probabilistic model techniques provide a structured approach for developers to incorporate uncertainty into their models and to evaluate criteria under alternate expectations regarding this uncertainty. They do so by using probabilities or random or unknown values. And so we will see how to do that later on when we start uh, building out some real software. Let's talk about the difference between quantitative versus qualitative data, because this is an important distinction as well that unfortunately the textbook just doesn't go into it and it assumes you already know this stuff. Um, so any modeling process starts with data, right? And so like raw material for a factory, the data is then manipulated or processed into information that's valuable to the people who's using your application. So the processing and manipulating of the raw data into meaningful information is at the heart of data modeling. That's what we're trying to do when we build out our applications. So in dealing with a problem, developers may have to consider both qualitative and quantitative factors. So the quantitative data are measures of values or counts that are expressed as numbers. So again, we were quantifying our ingredients. We were quantifying heat. We were quantifying time whenever we build out a recipe. So for our qualitative data, those are measures of types and may be represented by name, a symbol, or a number of codes. So like, for instance, the qualitative data could be things like labels, like names. Um, for instance, in cooking, you might have labeling like fruits or vegetables. Like when you make a meal, you might have labels where it has to have a protein, a vegetable, a fruit, and a starch, right? So those aren't quantified things. Those are qualified things. So does everyone kind of see the difference between, so when I give a label to something, like for instance, if I wanted to quantify, start quantifying this class, if I want to start data modeling this classroom, every person here can be a composition of different data models. I might be able to uh, ascribe the age, which is a number, that's a, that's a uh, quantity, right? So that's a quantitative data for each person because it's represented as a number. So you would have one age, you would have one age, you would have one age, so everyone has an age. So that is one way that I can define each person this wrong. Another way I could use would be the qualitative data, which would be your name, right? That's not something I can necessarily ascribe a number to, but it's a set of meaningful labels or values. So you have a name, you have a name, you have a name, and each person has a name in this wrong. And then maybe I can go ahead and also identify each person as their major. Well, is your major a quantitative or a qualitative form of data? It's qualitative, right? Because it's a label and not a number. Okay, is your GPA a quantitative or a qualitative form of data? Quantitative. Right, exactly. Um, so you could see, and there are some times where you can take qualitative data and map it to become quantitative data. Because let me ask you this. Your grade that you get in this class, is it a quantitative data or is it a qualitative data? It's quantitative and qualitative. It can be represented numerically or as a label from A to F, right? Or maybe with the absence of E in there, right? So that you can have a translation between qualitative and quantitative and quantitative back to qualitative. That's right. Any label that is not a uh, number is qualitative. And if we can ascribe a, a number to it, it's quantitative because we can define a quantity to it. 
Uh, and you could do a mapping. You can define a mapping to translate qualitative data into quantitative data or quantitative data into qualitative data, but then you're transforming it, right? Because the A isn't a number, but it can represent something that's numerically relevant, such as the value 90 or higher. A B isn't a number, but it can have the representation of a number between 80 to 89. So it's an abstraction. It's the ambiguity that we sometimes like to have because abstractions are powerful concepts and then numbers are super precise. And sometimes it's meaningful for us to represent the same thing in the form of both qualitative and quantitative, but I definitely wanna hearken, I want everyone to understand that those are the two kinds of properties that we can start defining things, seeing the world in, uh, using the lens to start mapping things into formal languages. Okay, let's talk about using computers in data modeling, because so far what I've talked about right now could be done on with pen and paper, could be done in our minds, right? It could be done smoking, it could be done written, written down on paper, but it doesn't necessarily need a computer. But what we want to learn how to do is use computers, right, these tools, to be able to implement our formal models, our, our, our mathematical models and our algorithms so that we can execute them automatically and not by hand. Okay, and so the steps involved in data modeling can be uh, very verbose. Uh, and so this is the kind of illustration here on the side of what this would actually look at. So there, you can think of this as having three distinct steps. So regardless of the size, regardless of the complexity of the model at hand, the problem at hand, your data modeling process involves a formulation of the, uh, the data model, the solution that you need to result in, and then an interpretation of it. So the figure provides a schematic over these uh, steps along with the components or parts of each step. We discuss each of these steps in the following sections. So here, the formulation can be broken down to defining the problem, developing the model, and then acquiring your input data. Your solution is then developing the solution. So the algorithm that processes your input into the output and then testing the solution to make sure that it's correct. And then once you have the result, you want to interpret it, right? You want to translate your formal language result into, you reparse that and translate that back out into what it is in the real world to see if it matches, if what the data you put in and the, the result you get out actually is representative of the, the problem that you're trying to solve with your application, regardless of whether it is, whether it's a physics problem or an accounting problem, or whether it's a cooking problem. Okay, so let's talk about formulation. Formulation is the process by which each aspect of a problem scenario is translated and expressed in terms of a mathematical model. This is perhaps the most important and challenging step in data modeling because the results of a poorly formulated problem will almost surely be incorrect. And again, this is what we're really going to stress training you on all throughout the semester. This is the hardest part of coding. I've, been, I've heard repeatedly, I've taught this class for many years now, and the number one thing I hear on a consistent basis is that I understand what the individual Java statements do. When you show me how to print something, uh, I, I understand what's happening in that statement. If when I do uh, a selection statement, so when I use like an if else statement, if I do a repetition statement, so if I do like a while loop or like a for loop, like I, I understand what that's doing, but I don't know how to piece those individual pieces together to build an application. And that is the most challenging part. And that's the part that's hand wavy, right? That's the part that a textbook can easily try to ignore and say, here, we're going to teach you Java and we're going to show you all these Java bits. But the magic isn't in learning the Java bits. That's like trying to tell someone who wants to write a novel, I'm going to teach you all these words. And once I teach you all the words, those are the same words that are used in all these other novels. So then you could just write a novel then. But writing a novel is more than just combining words that you know together. And it's the same thing with applications and it all starts from that basis. So like with a novel, you might start with designing like a, a, uh, a plot, like a, uh, an outline, right? You might start with an outline and you keep building on top of that basic outline. So for our algorithms, for our applications, our outline is gonna be the models we select and the, 
the story will be the algorithm that we apply on top of that model. Okay. So inside of this, uh, inside of step one, we're gonna define the problem, we're gonna develop the model, and we're gonna inquire our input. So defining the problem. So the first part is to develop a clear, concise statement of the problem. The statement gives direction and meaning to all the parts that follow, uh, uh, parts that follow it. In many cases, defining the problem is perhaps the most important and the most difficult part. It is essential to go beyond just the symptoms of the problem at hand and identify the true causes behind it. One problem may be related to other problems and solving a problem without regard to the related problems may actually make the situation worse. I'll give you an example of that, where you might've actually seen where the solution of one problem requires some other problem. Let's go back to a cocktail recipe, for instance. Let's say I'm making something like a uh, old fashioned. And so the ingredients might be bourbon, right? And it might be uh, some bitters. It might be a cherry, it might be an orange and it might be some simple syrup, right? And so, well, now I have another problem. Simple syrup in itself has a recipe, right? I might not just have simple syrup, so then I have to go look up the solution for that problem before I could solve this problem of building an old fashioned. So then I see, oh, a simple syrup might be uh, two parts water, one part, part sugar. And you boil that and you dissolve the sugar into the water and now I have a simple syrup. So then I have to do that before I can make my old fashioned. So just like, and so, we'll see things like that in a more generalized approach where we'll have these smaller problems that we solve that feed into the larger problem that we're trying to solve. And we identify that during this formulation phase where we're defining all the different parts of the problem and what problems rely on other problems or like what models rely on other, other smaller models. So does, does that kind of make sense? Okay. Then we'll have, then once we've defined the problem, so once we define what it is we're trying to do, then we start developing the models around them. So again, the first thing we wanted to do when we were making a cake was say, hey, we want to make a cake. And then we're like, okay, the next thing we need to do before we make a cake is then uh, make sure we understand the models by which we're going to follow the recipe. So the making the cake requires us to understand what a cup is, right? If you don't have a cup measuring tool, then the recipe that says use a cup isn't going to work out so well. Like if you use a pint glass as your cup, that's gonna be wrong, right? So here we start developing the models. Now in cooking, we already have those models developed, but when you're writing software, you get to design the models. You get to ascribe the systems of meaning, or you get to, you get to decide which ones to use. Right, like so, whoever decides to do the cooking recipe decides to use cups, but they could have used pints, right? They could have used pints of flour. There's no reason why they couldn't. It's another measure for it, but what they couldn't have used is degrees of flour or seconds of flour, because those measures don't quite make any sense. Okay, so once we select the problem to be analyzed, the next part is to develop a data model, even though you might not be aware of it. You have been using models most of your life. For example, cooking recipes are models plus algorithms for making food. What sets data modeling apart from other modeling techniques is that the models we develop here are mathematical. A mathematical model is a set of mathematical relationships. In most parts, the relationships are expressed as equations and inequalities where they may be processed to compute, for example, things like sums or averages or standard deviations. Most models contain one or more variables and parameters. A variable, as the name implies, is a measurable quantity that may vary or that is subject to change. Variables can be controllable or uncontrollable. A controllable variable is also called a, um, well, a variable. A problem parameter is some measurable quantity that is inherent to the problem. In most cases, variables are unknown or changing values where parameters or our input data are given values into the model. Okay, so let me kind of exp express that out. There's this concept with our model that we'll call parameters. The parameters are the things we feed into it. So those aren't known to the model itself until you execute that model. So an example of a parameter uh, uh, for our cake would be inputting all the different uh, uh, flour or the size of the cake maybe. Like, so for instance, with a cocktail, 
recipe, we might express all of the units in parts. And then you can change the quantity that you're inputting into the cocktail recipe. So you can make a pitcher or you can make a single glass and you can follow the same recipe. So the, the input into that algorithm into our model could be represented as a set of parameters. So the initial inputted data and then the values that are actually defined inside of our model. So when we start creating our recipe, if we have a starting point and ending point, right? Where the rest of where the ingredients come in all the way into where the ingredients are uh, composite together and produce the final product, then those are gonna be our var variables with inside the model that can mutate and change state over time. And the things that don't change state over time are constants. Do those concepts kind of make sense? Okay, so three things to think of when we're talking about models, parameters in, variables inherent within the model, parameters come from the outside but get inserted into our model, and constants are things that are quantified but they or qualified but they never change over time. Uh, most models contain one or more, yep. Uh, all, so all models should be developed very carefully. They should be solvable and realistic and easy to understand and modify and the required input data should be ob obtainable. Okay, so for acquiring input data, once we've developed a model, we have to get the input data into the model. So usually almost every kind of model we have, we have to tell it what the starting state is. And then, so step two is where we try to process a solution. So the solution step is when the mathematical expressions resulting from the formulation process are actually solved to identify the optimal solution. It's broken into two parts, developing a solution, where we, let, we figure out how to use our model and manipulate our model so that we can evolve our initial state, our starting set of ingredients into the final processed uh, output that we want. So again, the entire point of developing a solution, that's gonna be our algorithm, that's gonna be our step-by-step -step instructions that say, how do we move from a set of ingredients to a final cake? And then we test that. After we're done, we might take a bite of the cake, right? Like when you're cooking, you're constantly testing. When you're serving it, like, is it lumpy? Let me taste this, uh, the batter to see if it's sweet enough, if it needs salt, if it needs sugar. And then if you're happy with it, you move to the next step, right? If you're cutting, you might go ahead and spread it out and make sure that everything's diced appropriately and you might miss a piece or maybe there's a piece that looks kind of rotted or whatnot and you throw that part off. So each part through the process of cooking, even in between stages, you might test before moving to the next step. And that's important, that's an important part of the process. And then when the cake's finally made, you, you eat a part of it and say, yeah, that, that's a well-made cake. And then finally, you have the interpretation which is uh, assuming the formulation is correct and is successful, impl uh, successfully implemented and solved, how does the user use the results? Uh, with recipes, this doesn't make so much sense, but sometimes for other things that are more abstract in general, there's an interpretability there. Like how do you translate what your output is back into the thing it's supposed to represent? So when I was first talking about natural languages and how you're parsing my words back into concepts, that's the interpretability step. And then again, you can have like the concept of ambiguity there. So you can ascertain how much ambiguity is, which is what your sensitivity analysis is. But I'm not so worried about that. So it's also important that your model is readable. We strongly recommend that you get in the habit of using descriptive titles, labels, and comments in any data model you create. So this means while we're authoring our code, or if you're building a recipe, you just don't use like random variables like X and Y, uh, be very descriptive as to the labels or things that each thing's supposed to represent. So when you go back to read your algorithms or your models in the future, you understand what you intended. I um, don't care about that. So I just wanna finish off this slide. So, so I'm not, I don't really care about problems with modeling because we'll encounter that over the semester, but I will share these slides so that you can go ahead and see them in the future. So I just wanna finish off by giving an example for developing models. And so here computer applications are composed of two things, right? Systems of models, usually more than one, like in our recipe, we use three different models, right? So those could be quantitative or qualitative and it's a definition for an object or behavior on our application. It's also algorithms to process information results from the model. So that's our order set of instructions. So for instance, with our cake, if we wanted to make a cake, we have to define how do we measure our ingredients how do we measure our heat? 
and how do we measure our time? And so those are three different models. So if we were to express a cake as a composition of what it is in a software application, well, that would be a quantity model plus a temperature model plus a time model plus the algorithm, the sequence of steps. So if I wanted to do this to say make a video game, I might have to ask myself, well, how does my character exist? I might give it labels like a name. And so I would have a list of names. How does my character walk around? I might use a coordinate system like a grid where I have an X and Y coordinate. So I'm quantifying the idea, creating measures of my idea of how I can move. I'm, quanti I'm qualifying my idea of existence. And finally, my character might have to survive. It might have to be alive. I have to define mortality. So I have to quantify. I might give hit points then. If I'm at zero hit points, I'm dead. If I'm at positive hit points, I'm alive. And I can take damage in the form of hit points where that's a, a subtraction operation, right? So I process the character's mortality by reducing the hit points when it gets damaged or adding hit points when it heals back up. And again, what we're doing is we're taking a phenomena, an observation, a concept, and we're mapping a model on top of it. And then our game will then define an algorithm on top of those models that we can then use to make our character move around when the user wants it to move around, to engage in combat and potentially die or get experience points when they kill monsters. And that's going to be the underlying basis of how we're going to start building out our applications. OK, so I'm out of time. Is there any questions? But that's also the last slide for this presentation. So I'm perfectly where I want to be here. Uh, is there any questions up to this point for where we're at? Everyone feels good about the, these concepts. Okay, so next lecture, next week, we will start with talking about the basics of algorithms, especially as it relates to computer algorithms and what are our requirements from that. So I can't wait to see you all next week, next Tuesday, yes? Yes, but it's the same thing you did in lab. What's that? Well, okay, I'll do this. I'll go ahead and I'll extend, I won't change the due date, but I won't apply a late penalty for it. So I'll give you until uh, the end of day of next Tuesday. So we have at least one more lecture day so that we can actually see me uh, uh, execute Java code. So if you can't get it turned in by Friday, don't stress. So if we didn't lab, we're done. Yeah, but yes, if you didn't, but make sure you turn it in on Moodle. So I have a Moodle submission because okay. that lets me know, again, I use Moodle to be able to track the progress of each and every one of my students. So I know whether you're caught up with all the like uh, course content or not. So please submit any like homeworks that you've completed. So I know that you're caught up with where we're at. Excellent. Any other questions? Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Uh, probably. Mm, I think she, I don't remember that. I think it's like uh, 316 or 317 or something like that, but it's, it's on this side. It's like almost directly on top of us. It's right next to the like uh, the main office. Okay, so if we, if we have questions with the lab sometimes, um, can we ask you those 